Welcome viewers to our ongoing program, Focus, coming to you from Channel 17, Center for Media and Democracy here in Burlington, Vermont. This is Town Meeting TV. We're on remote now, and because we're still going through the coronavirus pandemic. So uh, my guest, welcome Sharon Toberg. Welcome back, Sharon Toberg. Oh, thank you, Margaret. Yes. Good to be Sharon, here again. Yes, you, you did two programs with me in 2019, and uh, you are the policy analyst for the Vermont Right to Life Committee, www.vrlc.net. And we are addressing this ongoing question, does abortion belong in Vermont's constitution? That's the title we agreed upon, Sharon. And um, so this is actually part six of the program, which we, we, did, we didn't have any program at all in, in the first pandemic year, 2020. And Sharon, is it okay with you if I read article 22, chapter one of Vermont's constitution to start us off? Oh, sure, that would be the constitutional amendment that has been proposed here in the state of Vermont, so. Why don't we share it with the viewers? Okay. Article two, oh no, it's article 22 of chapter one of Vermont's constitution. That an individual's right to personal reproductive autonomy is central to the liberty and dignity to determine one's own life course and shall not be denied or infringed unless justified by a compelling state interest achieved by the least restrictive means. Okay, first of all, Sharon, let me clarify, is, it is Article 2, right? It, it's Article 2 of Chapter 1. No, it, would, it is proposed to be Article 22 of Chapter 1 of the Vermont Constitution. That is the language that will be added to the Vermont Constitution uh, if the voters approve it when they vote on it in November of 2022. Okay, so this will be, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Sharon, this will be added to the Constitution if the voters vote on this particular language. Uh, yes. The Vermont legislature in 2019 took up both uh, a piece of legislation, which I was here discussing previously when I was on your program, uh, called H57. And that legislation put into Vermont statute that abortion is legal, unrestricted, unregulated uh, throughout the entire nine months of pregnancy. That legislative initiative came out of uh, some meetings held between uh, Planned Parenthood, the ACLU, some key legislators who met with the attorney general and staff from the attorney general's office for months throughout the summer of 2018 to create this language for uh, legislation to put, that, put abortion into Vermont statute as well as to follow up with this constitutional amendment. The main purpose of this constitutional amendment is really to prevent any future legislature from changing what was passed in H57, which became known as Act 47 of the legislature. The legislature voted in 2019 for unrestricted, unregulated abortion. The legislature rejected every proposed amendment that would have a limit, limited abortion, including limits on late-term abortion, uh, requiring a per parent to be notified if a minor was seeking an abortion, health and safety regulations for abortion facilities, and many more amendments that would have put limits on abortion throughout pregnancy. They were all rejected by the legislature. So that language went into Vermont statute. And now what they're trying to do is amend the Vermont constitution to make sure that a future legislature 
cannot change the law on abortion in Vermont. Okay, and Sharon, let's go over the language because the word abortion is not in this proposed amendment at all. No, the, the word abortion is not in the amendment. Uh, there is also sort of a purpose section that was passed along with this proposal. Abortion is not included in that purpose section either. Even though Vermont Right to Life and the ACLU and the Legislative Council said it, it would be advisable to include abortion in there, they, the, that language was not included. But it is very clear that this is an abortion amendment and that it is intended to protect what was put into Vermont statute that is unrestricted abortion throughout pregnancy. And is there any, uh, anything in the Vermont statute that protects the unborn or wh however people wanted to call it the nine month journey that the fetus, the, uh, the uh, impregnated seed takes to produce a human being. Is there any, is there any language in the Vermont, is there anything in the Vermont statute that protects the unborn? Uh, no, there's nothing. Uh, in fact, it is very clear from case law in Vermont that a fetus has no rights until it is born alive in the state of Vermont. That is, the child has to be born and has to take a breath before it's considered a person with rights in the state of Vermont. And the legislature rejected adding such language to Vermont statute that would protect um, a, a fetus at any stage of development. And one other issue separate from abortion too is there's no protection for a woman who wants to carry a child to term who is a victim of a crime that causes the death of the fetus. We've had instances here in Vermont, there was a case in Bennington where a woman who was pregnant with twins, viable twins, was struck by an impaired driver and she lost the twins, both, both the babies died. And the news reports said, nobody died in that car crash because these twins were not born alive. So they didn't count in the eyes of the media and they don't count in the eyes of Vermont law. And they won't ever be able to count if we pass this constitutional amendment. Okay. And in the language of this, of this proposed constitutional amendment, it says that indiv individuals, without saying whichever sex, the individual's right to personal reproductive autonomy. What is personal reproductive autonomy? Well, personal reproductive autonomy does not have a fixed definition. Over the past decades, it has come to include things such as the right to choose or refuse sterilization, the right to choose or refuse contraception, the right to choose or refuse abortion. It encompasses how people become pregnant, but it doesn't have a fixed definition. And every time there is a new court case dealing with a reproductive rights issue, the, the definition can be expanded to include something else. That's one of the things that is so troubling about this amendment is while we all understand that it does in fact mean abortion and sterilization and contraception, there's a potential that courts could interpret it to mean many, many more things, things we haven't even thought about. And one point you just made is it does not reference gender just about all of the reproductive rights cases that have been heard by courts thus far have centered around well, women's rights, but this is uh, gender nonspecific. And throughout the debate over this amendment in the legislature during the testimony in the legislative committees, it was repeatedly said that 
various terms and this amendment is going to mean what the courts determine that it means, what the courts decide it means. Particularly, as I said, in the area of people who can't get pregnant, the courts will decide what, what it means for reproductive autonomy for people who can't get pregnant. And when you're going when you're going into the difference between a, a man and, and a woman in this, what about uh, the rights of the the male in uh, in the abortion question? Well, th those are some good questions, and we aren't going to know until some of these issues work through the courts if this amendment becomes part of our constitution. Of course, it, uh, men can't have abortions, but do they have a right to not be fathers in some way? Do they have a right not to provide child support under this amendment? That's a question. If they, uh, we, really, we really don't know what it means for men. There have been cases at the federal court level of men who say, I, I deserve a right to choose just like a woman can have a right to choose an abortion, I deserve a right to choose not to be a father. Those cases have not been successful and child support has continued to be required, but we're entering very new territory here. There is no state in the country that has this type of amendment in their constitution and we're really don't know what the courts might do with it and how the definition of personal reproductive autonomy might expand in the future. And Sharon, we are a nation of laws. And when you say the courts, the courts will decide uh, on based on what laws regarding reproductive rights. Well, certainly they will look at what the legislature did with age 57, where, where they said, uh, we reject any limits on abortion. There's some interesting language in this proposed amendment about uh, a compelling state interest. That is a, a legal term that is used to hold courts to the very highest standards when they are evaluating whether a regulation or law would be permissible under this uh, proposed constitutional amendment. And one thing they will look at is they will look and see, okay, our, the Vermont legislature in 2019 did not find it to be compelling to protect an unborn child at any stage of pregnancy. They did not find it compelling that uh, a parent be notified before uh, their minor daughter has an abortion. It was not compelling to have health and safety regulations for abortion facilities. So those are some factors that will play in. There are some people who think based on that language about a regulation to further a compelling state interest, they think that that's in there to, to allow there to be regulation when in reality, it is in there to prevent as many regulations as could possibly be thought of. Of course, we do not know what a Vermont court will do with this, but we do know at a national level what the Supreme Court and federal courts have done. And for instance, you know, I know many people are familiar with the debate that was held some years ago over the partial birth abortion procedure. Um, wherein a living unborn child is mostly delivered, leaving just the head inside the woman's body. And then the child is stabbed in the back of the head with scissors and the brains removed to kill the child. That was uh, outlawed by the US Congress. Even our very own pro-choice Senator Patrick Leahy voted in favor of that law. It was challenged in the courts and it was upheld by the US Supreme Court, but it was not upheld under this very high compelling state interest standard. It was un upheld under a much lower standard, the what is called undue burden standard. So there are these different levels 
that courts look at to decide whether something's allowed. And, and when you think of something like a partial birth abortion, yeah, that's not something that's been upheld as a compelling state interest. So, the, so when we think about what might be a compelling state interest, it's gonna have to meet a very, very, very high threshold. And uh, most abortion regulations have no chance of meeting that threshold. Well, when you bring up the term pro-choice, does this amendment speak to the pro-choice community in a, in a, a, a comprehensive way? I think we have to recognize that there are a lot of people who consider themselves pro-choice, but who do not support H57 and do not support uh, unregulated abortion throughout all nine months of pregnancy. Uh, when the vote was held on H57, there, there was a Democrat representative who was very supportive of, of many regulations. And, and she said, you, you know, the, the fetus is not nothing. And that's what the abortion lobby, what the Planned Parenthood abortion lobby wants to see in statute and in the constitution. The idea that the, that the fetus is nothing and deserves absolutely no consideration and that abortion should not be regulated in any way because of that. But I think most people, even if they're pro-choice can recognize that the fetus is not nothing. And particularly when we're talking about viable children who, who would live, but if they were born at the stage of development. And it brings to mind all of the progress that's been made medically in, in prenatal care in the past century that uh, come to mind today about what some people would call rescuing mm -hmm. children who are at risk in, in, the, in the womb of the, of the, of the mother. Well, there was, I saw a story recently, there were a set of triplets born at the UVM uh, Medical Center, and they were born at 22 weeks, and all three of them lived and were released from the hospital and are doing well. But the UVM Medical Center performs elective abortions at 22, 21 weeks, seven days gestation. So that's a day before these twins were born. They perform elective procedures then, and they will continue to perform abortions uh, throughout pregnancy. Sometimes they have an ethics consultation and consideration. Sometimes they don't. But on the one hand, you have a set of triplets born at basically the same stage as the time they are doing abortions. It, it just doesn't make sense. How can you know, children be worth protecting and saving in one instance, but they're, they're just nothing in another instance? Well, that brings to mind the, what is, <clears throat> what is you as a, as a representative, the, the policy analyst for Vermont Right to Life? What do you mean by right to life? Well, Vermont Right to Life believes in upholding the sanctity of human life from conception through natural death. And we uh, oppose abortion, infanticide, and euthanasia as actions that deny the right to life. So that, yeah, that is our organization's position. Uh, but we work with a lot of people who, as I said, con consider themselves pro-choice, but are just really appalled at the thought that in Vermont, you can have an abortion for any reason at, at any stage of pregnancy. Uh, and the, the other, one other item to recognize is that we have some legal precedent here in Vermont around uh, abortion and taxpayer funding of abortion. The state of Vermont is paying for abortions for women who qualify for uh, Medicaid and it is likely if this constitutional amendment passes, we will be paying for uh, many more abortions. We will be paying perhaps for uh, in vitro fertilization, surrogacy, uh, who knows, whatever kinds of reproductive 
procedures that are determined to be covered by this, it's very likely uh, they will have to be included in any state medical program that is put forth by the state. It's interesting that court decision that requires Vermont to pay for abortions, the judge said, unlike other states, the state of Vermont does not prefer childbirth to abortion. So that is the public policy stance that is in H57 and is in this proposed constitutional amendment, that there's no difference really between childbirth and abortion. They're the same thing that it doesn't really matter whether you do one or the other. So it's, it's very upsetting, as I said, to a lot of people who aren't as pro-life as I am and don't share my fully pro-life views, but still recognize, as I said, that a, a fetus maybe deserves some consideration and that the health and safety of women deserve some consideration. Sharon, uh, what, what, what are the things that will happen if this amendment is passed and is part of the constitution? You know, I, I think really your, your imagination is the limit. We've seen federally recently that the Biden administration has removed limitations on fetal experimentation and the use of fetal tissues in research. So there's, a po there's possibilities there that, that fetal tissue could become used more here in Vermont for research, that there could become a market for it, that women could proceed with a, a pregnancy just for that purpose, really, because they are going to have this right to, to do whatever they what they want. Reproductive autonomy will encompass the right to become pregnant for whatever reason you, you want to. Uh, there's also questions around, particularly uh, with young people, with minors, we are seeing uh, a lot of moves towards using cross-sex hormones in minors with, for transitioning purposes. And those, that is, will be free from regulation, free from parental notification, free from uh, any parental involvement at all. There won't be any requirements that, that parents be involved. Uh, and you know, the truth is we really don't know. We're told that Personal reproductive autonomy means a limited number of things, but that is just today. And as the courts go through cases and people come forward with challenges, it's, it's going to start meaning a much more broader set of things. And in, in your opinion, with, within the United States Constitution, with with our the definition of right of right to life liberty and the pursuit of happiness does that include protection for the unborn child well the the constitution uh does is it's actually the declaration of independence that was sorry, life, yeah. liberty and the pursuit of happiness yeah so that language isn't in the constitution uh it, I'm not a legal expert. I don't know if there's an argument to be made that language in the US Constitution could protect unborn children. Uh, but so I guess I, my answer to that is, is I don't know. It is interesting to note that uh, one of the rationales being put forward for passing a constitutional amendment is because we can't be sure what will happen at the US Supreme Court level with the Roe v. Wade decision. But what a lot of people in Vermont aren't aware of is that Vermont had legal abortion even before Roe versus Wade. We had a state 
a court decision that said abortion was permissible even before Roe v. Wade. And we also now, as I said, have enacted um, the Act 47, the unrestricted, unregulated abortion bill, and that is in Vermont statute. So regardless of what the, happens at the national level, uh, abortion rights are already in Vermont law. This constitutional amendment is not needed to uh, secure abortion rights now. As I said, its purpose is to prevent any changes to Vermont law in the future. And I think that's, it's not a good rationale in my opinion, because we don't know what's coming in the future. When Roe v. Wade was uh, passed, it, the age of viability of an unborn child was much further along. Science has pushed it back for weeks and weeks and, and we're going to continue to see changes. And what this constitutional amendment will do will prevent us from uh, addressing those changes legislatively with a with a democratically elected legislature. Hmm. Well, thank you, Sharon. You seem to to give us a, 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 an all encompassing view, knowing that you represent right to life, which is which you have expressed very well about your belief in the the value of the unborn child. And this is also a question of social values and what, what is a value? Like is, is, a, uh, is a, a, a uh, unborn child, is that something of value to, to the state and, can, and should it be protected? And I think that those are questions that we, we do have to answer before we uh, we consider this amendment to the Constitution, in, 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 which we will in the voting booth, right? It, it will be um, in the first, on the first Tuesday after the first Monday of November 2022, after it has been ratified and adopted by the people, when ratified and adopted by the people of the state. That, that's when we ratify and adopt it in that vote, November 22. Yes. That there will be a vote in November of 2022, assuming that the Vermont House of Representatives uh, passes Proposal 5 again, which we certainly expect that they will. Um, the Senate passed it the second time uh, here in April. The House, my understanding is they'll be waiting until uh, next year, the next part of the legislative session to take it up. And if they pass it, the voters will vote in November of 2022. Well, Sharon, in, given our uh, what we the question that we're addressing, does abortion belong in Vermont's constitution? Can you wrap up our discussion right now and and tell me your opinion of that? In, and and uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll go out with that. Well, not surprisingly, I, I don't think it belongs in the Vermont Constitution. And I think you hit it on the head when you said, what, what do we value? And this amendment says we, we don't value unborn children at, at any stage of pregnancy. And we don't value uh, their mothers because we won't allow even health and sta safety standards around the issue of abortion. So I think there's a, a lot of values that we hold that run contrary to this proposed amendment. So I'm, I'm hoping that uh, both pro-life and pro-choice voters will look at it and say, no, no, Vermont should not have abortion in its constitution. Thank you very much, Sharon Toberg, for your discussion with me today on this issue. And uh, I appreciate your, uh, your knowledge of the issue and all and the understanding that you bring to all the repercussions of the law. So well, thank, thank you, you for very inviting me to be on your program, Margaret. Yes, until next time, Sharon Toberg. And thank you, Channel 17, Center for Media and Democracy. And, and uh, happy spring, happy Mother's Day, second Sunday in May. Thank you. Goodbye for now.